And welcome to the program. Let me say right up front here that the situation with regard to our church's opening obviously is in process. Many red states have opened, and many blue states have even opened. All are mandated with restrictions, such as a small percentage of their members and attendees, no singing, etc. Thankfully, President Trump, back on Friday, May 22nd, gave a mandate to the governors across America to, well, let's just say, stop the insanity of blocking houses of worship and prayer from opening when our country needs prayer more than ever. Various Supreme Courts have entered this battle. The United States Supreme Court has been involved this past week. But let me say here, that does not mean that this battle is over. It is not over. What happens at the next pandemic? Should that be this fall? The goal of the progressive left is clear. Shut down all that is godly. This is the new America, folks. This is the new America. The fundamental transformation of America. And at a time when, quite frankly, suicide, domestic abuse, drug abuse, and more, it's all-time high. When despair is in the air, we need our churches. People need to be with other believers. They need prayer. They need encouragement. They need to be with the church family. Online services are not the solution when we're in an age of despair because of unwarranted quarantines and shutdowns and the loss of family businesses and businesses of a lifetime. Now many churches are open with, again, a limited attendance. So what we saw March through May, quite frankly, I believe was a test run. It will reappear and the battle has just begun. The left wants you to worship government. And many pastors and church leaders have said enough. We'll do it our way. We'll do it God's way. If Costco is essential, then our churches are more than essential. So as I said, as this program is airing, various states are at various levels of the opening process. Even with the Supreme Court intervention, expect progressives to still push back in the future. Expect tyranny masquerading as safety to rear its ugly head again. This battle is not over. Churches are in the First Amendment with free exercise of religion. We're going to look at that today. I'm going to bring on two pastors, both familiar to you. Before I do that, I want to play one more clip of Matt Staver, Liberty Council. He's been in the forefront of the fight for our churches now for three months. Here's Matt Staver. Staver said that churches should have always been considered essential because they do more than just offer a message. He added that since stay-at-home orders were issued, there has been an increase in domestic violence, child abuse, and suicides. Many churches do more than just music and a message, which you cannot just simply turn off the lights and go to a podcast. Many churches are so essential, they feed people, they counsel people, they provide a respite, a place of refuge. When the doors of the church is closed, many of them that we represent, the people go hungry. They have no counsel. Staver said going forward, they hope to encourage state leaders to abide by the Constitution's protection of religious freedom when they evoke emergency declarations. Well, government never had the authority to do what it has done to churches anyway. You know, everyone kind of walked into this because they said it was only two weeks. Well, two weeks has turned into two months, and for some, three months, and for some, they're even looking at possibly longer. Churches have a First Amendment right to exist. Home Depot, the other stores, they have no a constitutional right to exist, but churches do. Those rights don't go away. There's no pause button on the Bill of Rights or any portion of the Constitution, even during a pandemic or any other crisis. So we have the battle of the ages, certainly the religious liberty battle of the ages going on for religious freedom. And the president, with his announcement back on May 22nd, helped us enormously But the battle is not over. As a matter of fact, as I speak, there are governors, there are mayors. Frankly, there's a mayor of my hometown, Minneapolis, who says he's going to push back against anything the president says, even against what the Supreme Court of America says. He's going to push back and put massive restrictions on churches. To help me sort this all out, I want to bring on two pastors. You are familiar with them. Pastor Jack Hibbs, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, California, and Pastor Mark Henry, Revive Church in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, a suburb of the Twin Cities. Thank you both for coming. Let me start with you. Jack, we'll go kind of rapid fire here. You have made some national headlines, Jack. Now, you have a megachurch. I've had the privilege of ministering there twice, and I love your people, and I understand 
Your people are pumped. You're opening May 31st. Why did you pick that day? Talk to me a little bit about it. I love having the opportunity, Jan, to explain the answer to that. And I really mean that. I want to make sure that everybody understands I'm not speaking Christianese when I say, when this shutdown happened, the first 15 days, I mean, let's all remember back, President Trump asked the nation so nicely, you couldn't refuse him. You could tell it pained him Mm. to ask the nation to shut down, unprecedented move never before in American history. We complied fully, completely. Then, if you remember, he came back and said, the numbers are not flattening out. Can you give me 15 more days? Mm. At the end of those 30 days, on his part, wisely, he gave tip of the hat to states' rights, which means governor's control. From that time on, Mark and I have been under the leadership of our governors, whatever that may be. During that time, I have completely complied with the lack of leadership from Sacramento. In other words, Gavin Newsom went out of his way to avoid the church in all of his phases He would not recognize the church, so much so that when pressed, when can churches open up? He said, anywhere from three to six months from now, which when he made that statement, Jan, if he's saying three to six months from now, we're going to be right back in the next flu season in Southern California, Mm -hmm. which means no one's going to open up again. And he'll just kick the can, the Mm -hmm. church, down the road. He's avoided the church. It's his nature. We know who he is. We know him well. He doesn't even claim to have a spiritual life whatsoever, and frankly, the church has held Gavin Newsom accountable. He doesn't like that. So from the beginning, I began praying. I changed my teaching. I changed my personal private time to seek the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. During that time of prayer, I didn't even know this, Jan, but on April 26th, in the early morning hours, I had the date impressed upon my mind, like a rock falling out of the sky, May 31st. It wasn't until about a week later that I found out on the calendar it was Pentecost Sunday. Mm -hmm. And God confirmed it to me all along the way. So I got the staff together and we started prayerfully making plans. I didn't know that when I made an announcement that we were going to meet again on May 31st, I had no idea that there would be some thousands of pastors say, we'll meet with you too, up and down the state of California. You have over 3,000 with you, I believe. That's pastors? Yeah, that's correct. And let me clarify here that Governor Newsom has relented somewhat, but with very limited attendance that he has approved of. And I think in his mind, faith remains unessential. Quite frankly, I think to most in the left, faith is an inconvenience. Let me just throw the ball into Mark Henry's court. We got two different states. We got California and Minnesota. In a sense, there's no difference between them politically, but in a sense, there is because Minnesota's governor has backed down. You actually kind of predicted that could happen, Mark, with massive restrictions on churches in our area. And as I said a minute ago, the mayor of Minneapolis, I don't know how this will play out, but the mayor of Minneapolis came out and said, no matter what happens, the mayor of Minneapolis will push back against everything and anything to keep the churches closed. I don't know how that's going to play out, but Mark, talk to us about your plans. Definitely the governor here has been more supportive and actually interacting with us for several weeks now. We are anticipating a lot different scenario and story At unfolding. the same time, we have a Muslim attorney general. We do, and that makes things really complex mm-hmm. because currently the law gives him a lot of authority. The attorney general of the United States has been pushing back over the last several weeks on that, which is very important. A number of lawsuits have been filed against the governor and against the state of Minnesota That's by right. churches. It's gone from state courts. It's also in federal court now. So there's a lot of things happening, a lot of dynamics happening. But you will be open 7849 West Broadway Avenue, Brooklyn Park Revived Church, correct? Lord willing. I would prefer the rapture, but... And I would too. (laughs) Amen. Yes. And then it's possible. It's very possible. Jack, you told me here privately, I'm not going to reveal anything here, other than you said to me as we were just ready to record... You do have some pushback coming from your fellow brethren. What's going on? I guess I should qualify it by saying our church is large, as you said, and it has engaged the culture since its inception in 1990. Having said that, the world knows where we're at. The world knows our position on things. We've got no pushback from, quote, the world. The pushback hasn't even been from Christians. I've been inundated with letters of pro and con. And like anything in life, you guys, you know, for every hundred letters of pro, you get one letter of con, and it feels like an army screaming at you, be it as it may. I was shocked to hear from pastors rebuking me, 
accusing me of being negligent, of not being submissive to the authorities that be. What am I going to do when congregants die of COVID because sure. we've met? All of this tactic that, quite frankly, again, I was already ready for it, wasn't aware that I was ready for it, but I was. And studying through Ezra and Nehemiah, I was able to answer those critics. And I'm not saying it changed their mind or comforted them, but I had a biblical answer from the scriptures regarding pastors. Frankly, some pastors I didn't even know, they were so angry that we were opening our doors and I couldn't put it together. Why would they be angry? They're in Sacramento. Why would they be angry Mm. at me? I'm 600 miles away from them. I just think, Jan, that there's a spiritual, I think God is calling his pastors to open up the doors and maybe some are not listening or not willing. I don't know. Listen, here's a great example on your program right now. You've got Pastor Mark hearing from God to open up in June, and I'm hearing from God to open up in May. The date is irrelevant. It's that pastor's hearts are to open up the church, and I don't want to speak for Mark. I didn't have the theology of closing the church in the first place. I studied the bubonic plague and the church. I studied the Spanish flu in the church. Mm -hmm. I studied all the epics of when the world has gone through pandemics. This is the first time in the history of man that the church closed down. And not only that, worldwide. Worldwide. That's what this makes it very, staggering. It's worldwide. It's not a medical issue when you look at yeah. it that way. There's a spiritual issue in play yeah. as well. I agree. And I'm going to be blunt. I'm just going to call this tyranny in the name of health safety. Leftists have had a taste of power and they've become addicted to it. And I'm going to say this again, too. I may emphasize this one more time before the end of the program. Folks, if you think this battle is over, and if you think the church has won this round, understand that this battle is not over. I believe, quite frankly, it was just a trial run for those who want more control. It will resurface. And I'm aware that as I speak, many, many churches have reopened, although, again, with severe restrictions. Churches are often not even now allowed to sing. I mean, I ask, how many restrictions are there at Home Depot or Walmart, other than wearing a mask and staying six feet apart? Yet the church, though many are now open, have been shackled and put in chains, ordered by mayors and governors to follow a dozen guidelines. And if the Supreme Court overturns this, as they very well may in the next few days, expect it all to resurface because the left is in love with control. Just grabbed a headline here. City demands churches turn over names, addresses, phone numbers. Officials want information for surveillance of members. Let me read two paragraphs. Now one official is moving into extreme territory, demanding churches provide him with names, addresses, and telephone numbers of anyone who shows up to worship. The move by Quentin Lucas, the mayor of Kansas City, Missouri, already is attracting the attention of Liberty Council. Again, that's Matt Staver. Liberty Council noted Kansas City is requiring that churches submit lists of members and attendees along with their names, addresses, and telephone numbers to city officials for, they're very blunt about it, for tracking and surveillance purposes. One more paragraph. I'm running out of adjectives to describe how completely insane and tyrannical abuses launched by state governors and local officials against pastors and churches are becoming, this is Staver saying in a newsletter. It is as if these leaders never bothered to so much as glance at the Constitution they swore to uphold and defend. They seem to be governing from some make-believe dystopian viewpoint. The new order states that by recording names and contact information, the health department will be able to more quickly trace, test, and isolate individuals who may have been exposed to COVID-19. This is over an illness that it affects five, six, seven people out of 100,000 max. And yet the whole world has been altered as a result. Mark, I think there's some end time significance going on. I mean, this is almost lunacy to have the whole world disrupted. Not that we're not saying it isn't serious illness. We know folks who've actually succumbed to it. But nonetheless, the ratio is five, six, seven deaths per 100,000. And yet the whole world has stopped. You and I have talked about this over the years, and people have laughed at us reading Revelation 13 and how there's going to be this global government and how they're going to have this surveillance and how they're going to control food and movement of people. You and I have been laughed at, and I'm just sitting here laughing almost. We told you this was coming. We should not be surprised. Mm -hmm. We should not be surprised that the world hates the church. Jesus says that in the Upper Room Discourse. Don't be surprised. It hated me. It's going to hate you. We shouldn't be surprised that the idolatry of security is destroying America. 
we love our security and we're willing to give up right after right after right for security. When you have an idol, it will destroy you. We're living the consequences of our idolatry. Well Uh, said. Pastor Jack Hibbs, let's just talk for a moment or two. I want to talk to both of you about it, starting with you, Jack. I'm sure some of what you're kind of being hit with would be, well, what about Romans 13? A couple of verses here. Every person is to be subjection to the governing authorities. There's no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and those who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Jack, talk to us just a little bit about how you're handling the Romans 13. We're all concerned about being biblical in what we're doing here, and particularly in the issue that we're talking about. And yet throughout history, we find Christians end up being the evildoers, even though they are pursuing righteousness, as in this COVID case. We're trying to pursue righteousness, but right now I think we're seen as the evildoers if we're coming against the government. Jan, number one, a lot of people like to read the first portion of Romans 13, starting at verse 1. They don't read through what you just read through. Number one, it tells you right there in the Scripture that those authorities that be are appointed by God to maintain or to establish or to keep righteousness. Notice that. If you push against them, you're pushing against the very will of God, because he's established them. Here's the qualifier. They're doing righteousness. The word righteousness means doing the right thing. So, for example, whatever anyone's opinion of Donald Trump is, is irrelevant when Donald Trump preserves the life of the unborn child. What is that? It's doing righteousness. That is the word defined. Now, listen, here's the important thing. We have obeyed the federal government with Trump's request, 100%. Then we obeyed our governor's months, months and long stay-at-home orders. We obeyed. Now the time has come to obey not only God, because the system in California is proving to be unrighteous. They can't answer us in our Mm -hmm. questioning. When we ask them, they won't give us an answer. When we say, like Mark said a moment ago, we want to reach out to them, to the community regarding suicide. No, 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 you can't. Somebody's dying and they call, please can a pastor go to the hospital? We can't go in. They've gone overboard. And here's the bottom line for me. I cannot be accused of Romans 13 when I'm fully submitted to the county and the city that our church resides in. 100% committed to them. Totally submitted to them. Why? Because they have maintained the defense of righteousness. Our county and our city. Our state hasn't, but our local powers have. And then keep this in mind. If you go back to World War II, Hitler told the churches all logical and reasonable explanations as to what they were doing, and the church got on board. And they cited Romans 13. That's true, they did. They really did. It's in print, everybody. You can read about it. So we want to be very careful. Can I look at God in the eyes, and can he look at me and say, Jack, were you submissive to the government? Yes, Lord, 100%. And Jack, did you disobey the government when their commands were ungodly and unrighteous, and it was better to obey God rather than man? Yes, sir, I did. Because, dear friends, and with this I'll be quiet, If you're going to take that approach, then those men who died on the beach in Libya and not submitting to the new jihadist authority Mm -hmm. of ISIS in Libya, were they in disobedience to God? Those believers who wouldn't stop preaching in Russia and put in Siberia, were they disobedient to God? What about the Chinese and North Korean church right now that illegally meets and preaches and evangelizes and baptizes people against the law? Are you telling me that they are an affront to God? Mark Henry, you want to add to that? No, Jan, I would add another angle to that, that we got to also weigh in there. I'm totally where Jack is, and I appreciate his heart, his zeal, and his devotion to Jesus 100%. But I think there's one other thing we got to weigh in in all of this, and that is America is not the church. In America, Amen. all of us have been preaching this. America is going to face the judgment of God for its idolatry. Yep. One is this love for security. Another one is the killing of innocent children. Another one is the immorality. Another one is anti-Semitism that has crept up at different places at different times. We know God destroys nations because of those four things. And I have warned for my 33 years of ministry, America, be careful. Don't do those four things. We want to be in a place of blessing. Now, we know that as we read through the scriptures, America does not have a major role in prophecy. I'm glad you brought that up and I was going to address it. Go ahead. Because if that's the case, you and I have been saying, Jack, you've been saying this. We've been saying America has to somehow start to deteriorate as far as a global power. My friends, I would suggest to you this is the occasion. There is no way we're going to survive this economic tidal wave that's coming. 
the church is going to survive. The church may be dispersed. It may be more homegrown, like we see in the book of Acts. The church is going to survive until Jesus takes the church home, period. We see it in China and all those places that Jack just mentioned. But keep in mind, Nebuchadnezzar was sent to judge Israel. Jeremiah the prophet was the one telling the truth. Nebuchadnezzar is the servant of God, it says in Jeremiah 27. And they said, no, we can't accept it. I would just suggest that we need to weigh in carefully because we don't want to be fighting against God if this is the judgment of God against our nation. It will Mm. come. I want to play one more quick clip here. For 250 years, Americans have enjoyed the unfettered right to practice their faith as they choose. Now they don't. It happened overnight. Last month, Christians across the country were legally prohibited from celebrating Easter in their own churches. The national media barely noted it. How exactly is this happening? Well, it turns out that's not clear. Strangely, not very many people have asked. Politicians have no right to do any of this. They cannot make it illegal for people to go to religious services. The Constitution of the United States expressly prohibits that. The words could not be clearer. The First Amendment explicitly prevents government from making any law that inhibits the exercise of religious faith. That's not a detail or a footnote. It is a cornerstone of our history and of our legal system. Millions of people, probably your ancestors, fled to this country from around the world precisely because our Bill of Rights gave them this guarantee. It's why this country was founded. And in a moment, it's gone. How? Where did politicians get the authority to do this? Because some elderly, power-drunk epidemiologist told them to do it? That's not how our system works. It can't work that way. Occasionally, you hear someone complain about this. Some lonely civil libertarian will fret that we may be on a slippery slope toward losing our rights. If only. We're already there. We've slid to the bottom of that slope. Our rights are gone. No one has explained how politicians are allowed to do this. Where's the authority come from? How can they override the Constitution? Nobody seems to care. They're too afraid. But if you think this moment is scary, consider what might come next. Now that we've ceded all authority in the country to our political leaders, what can't they do? What are the limits to their power? That's not a theoretical question. It's not an argument over philosophy or political theory. It is the most practical possible question. The answer will define where this country goes next. What can't politicians do in the name of public health? As it stands, politicians won't let people worship or work or go to school or see their aging parents. They place the nation under house arrest. That's happening today, right now. But let's say we all get more afraid. What then? What couldn't they start doing? Could they intern people? Seriously. You can dismiss the possibility of that if you like, but remember that just a few months ago, most of us would have dismissed as ludicrous the possibility that propaganda spewing drones would be hovering above. Now we have them. So what's next? What can't they do? Let's draw a line at some point. Pastor Jack Hibbs, Tucker Carlson seemed to be saying in that little two-minute clip that nobody seems to care about all of this because everybody's so afraid. And they're trying to manage their fear, and they're letting government sort of manage their fear. How did we get here? How did we all get so afraid? I think we got here by, I'm speaking collectively as a nation. Mark was talking about the things that have prepared us for judgment. We've gotten to this place because of a lack of faith. We're conducting ourselves in a godless manner, even what is called church today. There's not much of a high view of scripture. Mm -hmm. And then comes a crisis of epic proportions. And notice what's happened. Even people within the, quote, church instantly jettisoned faith, so many of them, and embraced fear. And they've been crippled. The illogical things where at the beginning they said, wear a mask or stay six feet apart. Then a week later it was wear a mask and stay six feet apart. Then it was this. Then it was the other. Then it was we need testing. Then it was your eight. All of these things. And we had experts warring with experts about what it means, which means there are no experts if they can't agree on it. There's been this confusion on a global scale. There has been never before global fear in lockstep, mind you, as it has now. We've got government officials who otherwise would have never sat down and had a meal together suddenly in unison globally regarding shutting things down and doing the very steps that would destroy a culture. You say, well, yeah, but Jack, why? Listen, I believe why is because 
there is a spiritual thread Mm -hmm. of all of this because wherever there's fear and confusion and then man-made control, it speaks to the fact that God is separating, as it were, the wheat from the chaff. He is exposing the wisdom of man, which is of this world, the Bible says, demonic in origin, and the wisdom of God. And this is a turning point. Things will never go back. Yes, I so totally agree. Things will never go back to what we once knew, quite frankly, just three or four months ago. Again, we're so thankful that President Trump intervened back on Friday, May 22nd, stating that the various governors had to open the churches, and in many cases, they (laughs) reluctantly did with huge restrictions going on. And again, as Jack has just said, the left is in love with control. This battle is not over, folks. That's the point. The point of this hour is the battle has really just begun. And I think what we've seen in the last three months is sort of a trial run for, quite frankly, for tyranny. Talking to Pastor Jack Hibbs for the hour, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, California. Pastor Mark Henry, Twin Cities, Revived Church, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, on West Broadway Avenue in Brooklyn Park. You know, when despair rises, we need the church. And in Australia, there are more suicide deaths than virus deaths predicted that over 50% of small businesses will not recover from what's been going on March, April, May. Many, many churches will not recover. I've heard from several pastors they're going to start looking for a new career because their church is just not going to recover from this. They may be in a more hardline state, such as California, where Pastor Jack is headquartering. All of this because a lot of what's going on is just quite frankly unconstitutional, but unemployment heading to Great Depression levels. And I'll say it again, when despair rises, and we have despair, suicide, you name it, depression, alcoholism, we need the church. And that's been the point of the first part of this program. When despair rises, we need the church. So we're going to continue this again with my in-studio guest, Mark Henry, and on the line from Chino Hills, California, where I spent the month of January. And when I flew home end of January, I had no idea what was about to break a few days later. Honestly, it happened so fast. I think it stunned all of us how quickly it happened. And now, in just three months, the wreckage that has happened in just three months. We'll continue with our discussion. Don't go away. More in just a minute or two. Because no government has the authority to threaten the church that they're going to arrest the pastor and shut him down and they hold him in contempt of the law. No, these are cultures that are pushing against truth. They're actually hoping no one addresses them or stands up against their false actions. Please visit our online store at olivetreeviews.org. We have books, DVDs, and other items that will help you grow in your faith and also understand the times. We post articles daily at our website, including headlines. We are active on social media as well. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Here is Jan Markell and her guest as they wrap up today's program. Well, the next wave of the coronavirus is not a virus. The next wave of the coronavirus is economic implosion. The United States, as wealthy as it is, is now reaching the brink of bankruptcy. And we cannot continue like this. Something has to be done or else your people in your church will not be able to sustain their lives. And many experts are saying that the fallout of economic collapse, starvation, homelessness, not to mention the fact of severe depression, and God forbid, but the already increasing elements of suicide, Why is this happening? Now, I must confess, my opinion is very biased. The church has been, in some respects, communally, that is, locally, silent. Now, granted, all of us are reaching more people today than we ever have on the Internet. That's the mercy of God. But our local community has been spiritually starving. But be that as it may... Are we going to open up our doors? Are we going to continue to preach the gospel? Are we willing to obey God and get back to the business of the church? Welcome back. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio, and I'm so privileged to have two special guests with me for the hour. 
Familiar voices of Pastor Jack Hibbs, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, California, mega church in the Los Angeles area, in the Calvary Chapel stream, and Pastor Mark Henry from Revived Church, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, suburb of the Twin Cities, formerly Brooklyn Park Evangelical Free Church. Nothing changed, Mark, but you came and you changed the name. You've been here four years now, or is it five? Four, almost four and a half years, four yeah. Four and a half years in the Twin Cities. Yeah. Good things going on in that 7849 West Broadway in Brooklyn Park. We were talking a little bit during the break, and I want to go down this path for just a moment or so. We referred to Romans 13. We referred to the fact that we are to listen to the government and obey it. We pay our taxes. Look, we're paying our taxes that support, in some cases, Planned Parenthood. We've got some issues that we've got to deal with. But then came the issue of not just Romans 13, but how about Romans 1? Are we in a Romans 1 society and mindset? Yes. If you don't know what that is, look it up. There's going to be an end-time society we read about in 2 Timothy 3, and we read about in Romans 1. Mark Henry talked to me a little bit about it because, again, it's the reprobate mind. Mankind is given over to debauched thinking and a reprobate mind. But what does that mean to the average listener? When you look at that passage, Romans 1, it describes how unrighteousness suppresses righteousness. And it describes there the three movements of how man forgets God, doesn't honor God as he should, and God turns him over to his sin. Three times God turns people over to their sin. In the final conclusion of that, they give hearty approval to what is evil. That which is right is wrong. That which is wrong is right. They can't discern good from evil anymore. Those are the days we're living in. Jan, you have preached this. Jack, you've preached this. I've been preaching this. This is where we're headed. This is where we're going. We're watching this unfold. Friends, the Bible is true. God's judgment is here. Now, I love America. We need to pray for America. We need to be the righteousness that preserves America as long as Jesus allows. But friends, when you ignore God and you don't fear God, these are the things that come upon a nation. Pastor Jack Hibbs, you want to build on that? Man, I don't know if I can. That was fantastic, Mark. I couldn't agree with you more. You could look at Romans 1 as though a doctor was walking into a room with a clipboard and he's going to examine you and he's going to poke and he's going to pull and prod and he's going to write things down. If you look at America today and you look at Romans chapter 1, it's as though Dr. Jesus has walked around us, he's poked us, he's pulled, he's taken an examination, and Right along there, as unpopular as the culture is regarding the truth of Romans 1, you can just walk through it. But there's the fact that there's a suppression of truth, as Mark mentioned. There is the experts professing them to be wise. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that they, in fact, have become fools. It talks about the glorification of creation rather than the honoring and the worship of the Creator. And you look at all of these things, and the Bible says at the end of it all, God will give them up to a reprobate mind. You say, well, thank God that hasn't happened. It says when a reprobate mind has taken over a person or a culture, they begin to exchange the use of a woman's body and a man's body. In Romans 1, a man with a man, a woman with a woman, doing that which is ungodly and abomination in the eyes of God, and they receive within themselves the due recompense or reward of their private acts. The Scripture says that that's basically the last manifestation before a culture is destroyed. Romans 1, it's 2,000 years old, but it is America's health report, and it's a diagnosis of where America's going unless there's revival, unless there's a turning of the church, not the world, the church, back from this brink. There's actually no hope for America but for the church. I think Satan knows that, and that's why we have such a rift in our nation today, because I'm not saying Gavin Newsom is demonically possessed. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that Gavin Newsom may ignorantly be a pawn to the works of darkness that he doesn't even believe in. He's sinning against the church, the very thing that can help the community. And I can almost hear people say, well, Pastor, you just want Newsom to allow you guys to get back together to get your paycheck. Not true. I have a career. I can go back to biomedical engineering. I don't need this job. This is true. The church is the pillar of truth. It is God's witness in the world. Hallelujah. It's going to continue no matter what. It's up to the pastors in America today, though, honestly, to determine how will the church be after this virus, because no government has the authority to threaten the church that they're going to arrest the pastor and shut him down, and they hold them in contempt of the law. No, these are cultures that are pushing against truth. They're actually hoping no one addresses them or stands up against their false actions, because, again, as Paul appealed to Caesar, I appeal to the First Amendment. 
want to play one more clip. It happens again to be Matt Staver, Liberty Council, and he's been representing churches here for the last three months. I happened to catch him on the David Wheaton program. Quite frankly, folks, what's going on with our churches? It is illegal. It's a very big overreach, and the most restrictive states that we're dealing with from the beginning and even now are states in which you have an individual at the top who doesn't respect the sanctity of human life, is very radically pro-abortion, and if they don't respect life, they're not going to respect your freedom or your liberty. That's really a commonality that we see. If you don't respect life, you don't respect freedom and liberty, and that's what we see happening. There are people for several reasons. One, they have an animosity to Christianity and church. Or two, they have very little interaction with it. And from their perspective, they're just not essential. So they wipe them off the map as though they don't exist. Yet at the same time, saying that elective surgeries can't happen, but you can have an elective abortion, or that you can go to the liquor store because that's an essential activity that you need to do. We couldn't just shut that down during the pandemic. I mean, those are the kind of crazy things that are these arbitrary decisions that government is making. And frankly, the liquor stores, the Walmart, Kmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, all of those different places, grocery stores, they do not have a constitutional right to exist. Churches do. And there's two clauses of the First Amendment that give them special treatment over any other non-religious entity. And one of those is the free exercise of religion. Government has no right to tell you that you can or can't take communion, that you can have only 10 people in a 5,000-seat sanctuary. It doesn't matter whether it's a 50-seat church or a 5,000-seat church or that you can't have parking lot services. And I can give you examples of all of these things because we've been litigating with them. We've been pushing back on a lot of these restrictions. Thanks to the president and his proclamation back on Friday, May 22nd, where he basically just said enough, enough of this. You governors, you mayors, whoever would be in control of what the churches do and your neighborhood, enough, open up. And as a result, many churches opened on Sunday, May 24th. Others are going to be opening tomorrow, May 31st. Others are having to wait until June 7th. The reason some are waiting is that they have to comply now with massive restrictions just to open, whether it be attendance, how communion is done, you can't touch the wafer. In other words, no restrictions other than masks and six feet apart in Walmart, but the church now, many of them open or in the process of opening, massive restrictions, including some limited to just 100 attendees. Mark Henry, he says, if you have no respect for life, you have no respect for freedom. I guess that's a profound statement. It's absolutely right, Jan, and it goes right back. If you see God as the creator, I mean, Mm -hmm. you think about the Declaration of Independence, these truths are self-evident, and the idea of being created in God's image and the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, absolutely. You have to have a creator God. You have to have the sanctity of life, man being made in God's image, if you're going to have liberty Mm -hmm. as we understand it. Pastor Jack, I'm just heading down another alleyway here for a moment because a lot of my listeners follow you, your various online postings, and now you're doing some Q&As online, which is just fantastic. I think you're having good response to that as well, aren't you? Well over um, 100 or 200,000 viewers on each program. The best way to log on to that kind of programming is Real Life with Jack Hibbs, or can they do that through Calvary Chapel Chino Hills as well? Yes, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills. They can just Google that. They could actually Google my name, jackibbs.com. There's various platforms where all of those things air. So, yes. Mark Henry, you are putting a lot on Facebook Live, am I right? Correct, Jan. Yeah, we've used that medium, and the Lord's opened the doors, and we're reaching a lot of folks. You're reaching a lot of folks that way, perhaps more so than ever in your career. In the life of this church, our church here was started in 1958, I believe it is. We're reaching more people now than at any other time. I want to read a paragraph from David Jeremiah. It's under an article titled, The Great Quarantine Revival. Jeremiah says, I've been doing church, doing preaching for 50 years over. I'm all over the media, and I've never had anything like that happen ever. Would I rather have the 15,000 that we have on Easter sitting in the church with our choir and orchestra and Easter lilies and everybody cheering and praising? Yeah, I'd rather have that, but This is a new and different thing that God is doing. It's unprecedented. Then he concludes, On Easter Sunday, they reached a staggering 90,000 people who tuned in to his online worship. He says, I'm preaching right now to more people than I've ever preached in my life. Adding that after the service, he gave viewers the opportunity to receive Christ. And according to Jeremiah, over 600 people clicked that button. 
some will complain, well, you don't just click a button. That's not the point. The point is people are hearing and responding to the gospel in mega ways, at least numbers-wise. Jack, you're experiencing the same thing. Yeah. Dr. Ed Heinsen, who's a good friend of ours, he had reminded me just recently, he said, Jack, you know, I'm driving right now here in Virginia, and I'm listening to the radio, and your program is on, coupled with the fact that you happen to be on Sirius XM every day, which has 25.6 million subscribers, not to mention, like Mark, Facebook Live, YouTube channel, normal broadcast, live stream, all of that stuff. Dr. Heinsen said, you know, in one day, you alone, just one day, you alone reach more people than the Apostle Paul did in his entire lifetime. That's true. And it is true. It's shocking to hear that. It's true, because who are we? It's an indicator of the near return of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. Mm -hmm. He's coming back soon. Look, this is a privilege. God used the sequestering of the world to go into their homes and for this season preach the gospel. Look at what the CIA had mentioned. I guess I should be careful what I just said. I know from people who happen to work in central intelligence that they monitor everything online in the world. Iran, during the shutdown, had more Bible apps downloaded, Mm -hmm. more sermons listened to. Iran, what's going to happen to Iran with the word that has just been deposited? My point is this, that. Who's to say, Mark? Who's to say, Jan? What if Jesus is coming back soon? Now, we don't know the day or the hour, but Paul said in First Thessalonians, concerning the times and the seasons, my brother, and you'll have no need that I should write unto you. What if we're feeling the season? We don't know the day or the hour. Are we ever going to get back to our churches? Maybe. I don't know. What if the Lord comes back in a month? Could he? Yes. Yeah. What if all of this has gone on to get the gospel to everybody? I believe that this is a seasonal thing. Jack, what if it's not? And I agree with Dr. David Jeremiah. It's been fantastic. But it's been an evangelistic and teaching opportunity. We still need to get back to doing church. (laughs) Still have to get back to church. Mark? Jack, amen to all those things you just shared. I was really stirred as I was just trying to find the joy of the Lord in the midst of some of this. And I was reading through the book of Philippians. You remember Paul's in prison. He's been there now for three years, two years in Caesarea, appeals to Caesar, now crosses the Mediterranean, ends up in Rome. And he writes back the four prison epistles. And in chapter 1, verse 12, it says this, I want you to know, brethren, I want the church to know, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. So his imprisonment, his isolation, him being taken away from the churches has worked out to advance the gospel, not hinder the gospel. And in the midst of this, definitely our rights are being taken away. There's all sorts of evil things that are happening. 100% that's true. But understand this, all of us need to have this joy that the gospel is going out in a way that it never has before. And Paul uses three illustrations of it. The whole Praetorium Guard has now heard the gospel. So that's the inner circle, the security force of Caesar, of the emperor. Then it says, and everyone else in Caesar's household has heard. And then it says, the brethren have been strengthened and have been more bold. And I have seen that, Jan, over and over. People are sharing Christ as never before. Just yesterday, I had people writing me. My husband's watching the church service with me. This has never happened. It's an answer to prayer. My kids have trusted Christ. My neighbors trusted Christ. On and on and it goes. The church has become more bold than I've ever seen it before. Second is, there is a love for the gathering, Jack, that I have never seen. People every day when they jump online with us on streaming, whether it's the daily things that we're doing or the weekly service. They're like, I love you, church. I can't wait to be. I've never seen that before. The affection of Christ as never before has been cultivated. Right. We said earlier that we don't believe that things will ever go back to the way they were. Amen to that. I think people are going to be more appreciative, more worshipful. You know, Mark, who's to say? I mean, I hate to say this, but you and I know that Spurgeon wrote about something in lectures to my students about blessed subtractions. Mark, maybe not everybody who was with us earlier are going to be the same people that come back and reunite. It's true. What if some people who are into all of this for traditional reasons, the cycle, their habits been broken, they may not be back. But what about all those who you just articulated? They've seen the light, so to speak, in all of this, and they want Jesus more than ever. Some people who were not serious are now serious. Some people who were not saved are now saved. I think it's an amazing sovereign act of God working Mm -hmm. in his church. And Mark and I, at best, are under shepherds, maybe more accurately, we're sheepdogs in the ministry of God. And it is fascinating to watch this play out. Want to hit just another couple of issues here. I think the thing that's troubling most listeners right now, and we still have a few minutes where we might be able to discuss it here, is the overwhelming loss of liberty. Got a headline in front of me. Governor Abbott signs almost $300 million contract for contact tracing. 
Governor Abbott wants you to be monitored and tracked. Abbott gave the go-ahead for the Texas Department of State Health Services, $300 million, 27-month contract. We'll develop a staff of 4,000 employees in Texas, consisting of epidemiologists, et cetera, et cetera, contact tracers. There will be some sort of a health app that every citizen will be required to download on their phones. This will build a public registry for a future mandatory COVID-19 vaccination. Your movements and location will be monitored by a satellite. And then I saw a headline, World Net Daily, quoting Alan Dershowitz, respected attorney. Headline is, the state has the right to plunge a needle into your arm. I can summarize the rather shocking story. Alan Dershowitz, Harvard Law School emeritus professor, contends the Constitution grants government power to forcibly vaccinate individuals. I'm quoting him now. Let me put it very clearly. This is Dershowitz. You have no constitutional right to endanger the public and spread the disease, even if you disagree. Again, this is Dershowitz. You have no right not to be vaccinated. You have no right not to wear a mask. You have no right to open up your business. The interviewer, Jason Goodman, interjected, asking if the famed constitutional scholar was saying that if government decides, you have to be vaccinated, we have to be vaccinated. He answers, Absolutely, this is Dershowitz. And if you refuse to be vaccinated, the state has the power to literally take you to a doctor's office and plunge a needle into your arm. This is not for me to begin a conversation here about vaccinations. Obviously, the whole vaccination issue has taken a very dark turn in the last few years, so I don't want to head there. The point is, Jack, address the fact that our liberties are so being invaded that we don't even have the right to object to things that the listener may feel would be inherently wrong. They do not want a vaccination. They feel it will not only endanger their health, will endanger their life. And yet we have a very respected attorney saying, too bad, folks, you're going to have to do it. Jan, this is perfect. We all need to watch this. If you know anything about Alan Dershowitz and his history, you know that he would never have endorsed his own statement in all of his illustrious career. Never. His prestigious understanding and power and his professorship of the Constitution has made him a legend. If you would have taken his statement and erased his name and given it to him six months ago, four months ago, if you would have said, Mr. Dershowitz, will you comment on this statement? He would have looked at that and condemned that statement. He's already said this for 60 years. That's unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. That thinking is draconian. It's exactly what our founders fled Europe from. That is sick thinking, and nothing trumps the Constitution. That's what he would have said. So why is he saying something different and, in fact, almost borders on insanity? Mm -hmm. It's exactly what's happened. Faith is gone. Fear rules the day. Everything he said, he sincerely believes it because he's a man that has been brought to the brink of total fear, and he has no Jesus to lean on. Right. He has no understanding of Scripture. And so he doesn't know that perfect love that casts out all fear. So he's responding passionately over what he really believes now. And now when the storm hit, the Constitution went out the window. Yes. That's what's happened. That's one reporter's opinion, and it's from human observation. It's not from science. And it's not from fact, it's certainly not constitutional, no matter if he's out on Dershowitz or not. But I think this is what is terrifying a lot of people, is this overreach. And I'm talking about government overreach, not so much Dershowitz, though I think his comments are kind of a stretch. But I think they may be true. But again, we get back to this government overreach that it's like, where can we go to run to? There's really no place other than the Lord. There's no other country to run to anymore. Maybe Israel, I don't know. Jan, I would Go suggest ahead. this moves us as Christians where we need to be. Okay. Because we don't want to love this world. The world is True. passing away and it's lust. This should help us love Jesus' coming more. Yeah. Through the midst of all this, if there's one thing the church has got to do, one, we should share the gospel more. Number two, we should love the assembly of the people of God more. And we should also love the coming of Jesus more because this world yeah. is not what we're living for. We are living for that which is to come. That's a great illustration. Well, of this it. is a quote of yours, Mark. You didn't know I was writing this down when you were saying it, but you said the world wants Fauci and Gates, so relax and make it about Jesus and point people to Jesus. Yes. Not Fauci and Gates. That's what we're here for. That's what this program is here for. You wrap it up. You point know, people away from Fauci and Gates and point them to Jesus. I don't know where you're at in your spiritual journey, those of you that are listening right now, but I want to say this to you. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and you can have heaven. 
You can trust in the Lord Jesus right now. You can believe in him and he will give you the gift of eternal life. Jesus died on a cross to pay for sin. There's no other way you can be reconciled to God. There's no other way I can be reconciled to God. The fact is we are separated. We need Jesus. God sent him because he loves us, because he cares. Jesus died so that you might live. Why don't you trust him right now? Jack, I got a minute or two left. First, I want to give contact info one more time. And the best info for Jack would be Real Life with Jack Hibbs jackhibbs.com. It's Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, California. Wonderful mega church in Chino Hills. Love visiting it in the wintertime. Mark Henry Revived Church, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, 7849 West Broadway. Your best website is? Revived Church, Brooklyn Park. We'll get you there. Revived Church, Brooklyn Park. Jack, I'm down to, I got a minute, minute and a half. I want to give you an opportunity to wrap things up too. Going back to Dr. Ed Heinsohn, he for years, Jan, as you well know, has almost always opened up his sermon along the lines of Bible prophecy by saying that God has given us Bible prophecy not to scare us, but to prepare us, Mm -hmm. and that he's looking for the upper taker, not the undertaker. We need to remember that one of the many things, but one of the most beautiful things about our Bible and our God is that... Anywhere from 27 to 33 percent of that Bible of ours is eschatological, futuristic. Our God says something that nobody else can in their religion. Jesus summed it up. He said, I've told you these things in advance, that when they come to pass, you will know that I am He. And that's what we're watching. Nothing's falling apart, everybody. Everything's falling together. And if we do understand Bible prophecy and what we've preached on, it is inevitable for America to fall in some way, shape, or form along the wayside so that we see the fulfillment of Israel standing all alone. Mm. It hurts us to say it, but it's truth. We've come to the age where the church is being marginalized and rejected. Jesus said there would be days just like this. There's no need to be sad. There's no need to cower in fear because his love, that perfect love, casts out all fear. So look to him as Pastor Mark just said, you call out upon Jesus, You will eternally be glad that you did. He died for you, rose again from the dead, because we're all sinners and we need him as Savior. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Appreciate both of you giving up the time here today. I think I'll just go out of the program with a Bible verse. It's one of my favorite because I can't think of a time in my lifetime that's been, well, more unstable. Global instability, not just national instability. And so I turn to one of my favorite verses, Ezekiel 33, 6, and God will be the stability of your times, a wealth of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. And I hope you can say that as we go out of today's program, you can say that God is the stability of your times. I don't expect our times to return to what we knew even some months ago now. I really don't. But God and his word, they never change. They're the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want to thank you for listening. We'll talk to you again next week.